Hey everyone, welcome to Introduction to Cognitive Science. I'm Adam and the focus of our lecture today is on the cognitive neuroscience of language. In the last lecture, we covered the basics of neuroscience and neuroscience methods. We looked at the neuron um, and we considered the soma, dendrites and axons and how a neuron uh, works to communicate information throughout the nervous system. We consider different parts of the nervous system, including the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And we also looked at the endocrine system and the hormones that are involved in that system. We also considered major parts of the brain, the different lobes, including the occipital, parietal, um, temporal, and frontal lobes. And then we considered a more fine-grained analysis of component parts of the brain by looking at Brodmann areas. We also considered methods for studying the brain and behavior, including lesion methods, uh, structural MRI, functional MRI, EEG or electroencephalography, and TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation. And we considered the strengths and weaknesses of adopting those approaches. And in the last lecture, we also considered uh, two of the main perceptual systems, including the visual system, as well as the auditory system, just to get a, a basic understanding of the main components that these systems include and how they work together to bring about this amazing, uh, rich inner life that we have perceptually, okay? Now that we have acquired a nice understanding of uh, the visual system and the auditory system, the major components of the brain and how they function, our goal for today is to focus more specifically on uh, language, okay? Today, we're going to think in particular about what parts of the brain, what, which neural circuits are partly responsible for syntactic and semantic processing. The article that we're gonna look at today is by DePreto and Buchheimer, published in 1999, entitled Forming Content, Disassociating Syntax and Semantics in Sentence Comprehension. And this article was published in Neuron. So some of our driving questions for today are the following. Are different areas of the brain responsible for syntactic and semantic processing? And if so, which areas of the brain are responsible for syntactic processing and which areas of the brain are responsible for semantic processing? Recall that syntax has to do with sentence form or structure, whereas semantics has to do with sentence meaning or content. In this study, DePreto and Buchheimer conducted a fMRI study using functional magnetic resonance imaging to investigate the neural substrates of sentence comprehension using a task where the syntactic complexity of different linguistic stimuli was retained or remained similar. And we'll see in the next slide how we have examples of different linguistic stimuli, but they all have similar syntactic complexity. DePreto and Buchheimer manipulated the type of linguistic information, whether the information was semantic or syntactic, that subjects could rely upon in order to decide whether the meaning of two sentences was the same or different. All right, so we'll take a moment to appreciate the design of this study. So again, in this study, recall that uh, DePreto and Buchheimer, they wanted to figure out what parts of the brain are selectively active for processing syntactic versus semantic information. Okay. So what they did is they had participants listen to pairs of sentences or sentence pairs, and then drawing upon information from those sentences, they had to determine whether the pair of sentences were similar or different. Okay. 
In the semantic condition, each pair of sentences was identical in all respects, except for one word that was replaced with either a synonym or a different word. In the syntactic condition, the sentences in each pair were either cast in a different form or used a different word order. Okay, and we'll take a look here at the sample sentences, okay? So we hear, we can see here down in table one in the semantic condition. Uh, for example, consider that you're my participant. I'm gonna feed you or pass you on a pair of sentences. And in the semantic condition, this would be the pair of sentences. The lawyer questioned the witness and the attorney questioned the witness. Is that pair of sentences the same or different? And then notice that you have to cognitively draw upon information within those sentences to determine whether they're the same or different, right? And notice that they're very similar, right? The only difference here in this pair of sentences in the semantic condition is that the term lawyer is replaced with the term attorney, right? And by looking at what's the information included in those sentence pairs, we see that that's the only difference, lawyer, attorney, okay? And we know that they're synonyms or they mean roughly the same thing, right? What is an attorney? Someone that practices law, right? Um, and similarly, what's a lawyer? Someone that practices law, right? So they're both just uh, different words for the same general concept. So we can rate that pair as being similar, okay? And here's another example in the semantic condition. And let me know now whether this pair of sentences is similar or different, okay? So here's the sentence pair for you. The man was attacked by the Doberman. The man was attacked by the pit bull. Is that uh, similar or different? Are those sentences the same or are they different semantically? Okay. Notice again, you have to, using the information contained in those sentences, you need to now think, are, are, is the meaning the same or different here? Right. And we know, right, since everything else in this pair of sentences is identical, right, the man was attacked by the, right, all of those are identical. The only difference here is between Doberman and Pitbull. So by reflecting on that, are, is a Doberman the same as a Pitbull, right? And you can answer that they're different, right? Doberman's a very different type of dog than a Pitbull is. So we can... Um, judge those to be different, okay? So that's an example in the semantic condition, how we can, by using the information in the pairs, we can decide whether it's the, the pair uh, means the same thing or means something different, okay? Now that we looked at the semantic condition, let's look at the syntactic condition, okay? So the syntactic condition, again, I'm gonna, as you're my participant, I'm gonna feed you a pair of sentences. And then you have to tell me whether they mean the same thing or they mean something different, okay? Importantly, notice that whereas in the semantic condition, we're determining whether the sentence, uh, the pairs of sentences mean the same thing or mean something different based on the semantics of the word, of a word within that sentence, right? Everything within the sentence was the same, right? The, like you can see the word order and everything is the same in these sentences, but it's just the word difference, right? That we're picking up on in the semantic condition, okay? In the syntactic condition, notice that now it's not just a replacement of word, right? Here we see that the structure of the sentences are different, okay? So notice that in this syntactic condition, I can give you a pair of sentences and I want you to tell me if the sentences mean the same thing or they mean something different, okay? So I'm gonna give you this pair of sentences this time. The police arrested the thief and the thief was arrested by the policeman, okay? So the policeman arrested the thief, the thief was arrested by the policeman. By understanding those sentences, you know they mean the same thing, right? The policeman arrested the thief. 
or the thief was arrested by the policeman, right? So the only difference here, even though the sentence meaning is the same, it's the, the sentence is either formed in the passive or active voice, right? The passive voice being uh, the thief was arrested by the policeman, the active voice being the policeman arrested the thief, okay? So we see here that in order to determine whether those two sentences were similar or different, we had to go into those two sentences, right? That sentence pair, and we had to look at the information within those sentences, and by using that information, decide whether the sentences were the same or different, okay? And notice though here, we're not drawing upon just whether two words are the same or different. Here we're using structural information, right? I'm comparing the policeman arrested the thief with the thief was arrested by the policeman, right? So here in the syntactic condition, I have to do more syntactic processing, right? So that's the important thing here, okay? In the syntactic condition, I'm gonna be drawing upon syntactic information to make the judgment, whereas in the semantic condition, I'm gonna be drawing upon semantic information to make the decision, okay? And that's the important thing about the design of the experiment. Like what kind of information are we drawing upon in our different conditions, right? And then we can look at imaging data and see, okay, what part of the brain is active during syntactic information processing and what part of the brain is active during semantic information processing, okay? So we looked at the syntactic condition where these two sentences, one in the active and one in the passive voice are similar. Right? They mean roughly the same thing. If I tell you the policeman arrested the thief and I tell you the thief was arrested by the policeman, I'm telling you the same sort of thing, okay? Here's another example. Uh, the teacher was outsmarted by the student. The teacher outsmarted the student. And we know that uh, the teacher was outsmarted by the student and the teacher outsmarted the student, those mean different things, okay? And the here's just one more example of difference. West of the bridge is the airport. So we could say like this is the bridge and west of the bridge is the airport. And then the bridge was west of the airport, right? So again, that would be just an example of, of difference, okay? So we just notice here that in order to identify whether this is the same or different, right? The sentence pair, we need to look at the order, right? The form of the sentence and not just sort of like a difference in a particular word, right? If you notice, right, these include the same words, right? West, the bridge of an airport, okay? So that's the design of the experiment. Okay, now we'll go ahead and move on and look at some other results. Okay, so well, here is a nice figure showing some results. Figure 1A, the figure on the top, shows selective activation in brain areas responsible for syntactic processing versus rest. Okay, excuse me. So these are the areas of the brain up here that are particularly active or engaged during syntactic processing, okay? So when you're looking in your sentence pair and you're deriving structural information to determine whether the sentence is similar or different, you're gonna get activation here, okay? And here I, I made it very clear that this image shows sort of like the syntactic condition minus the rest condition, okay? Because what I don't want to sort of, the picture that I don't want to paint here is that like the rest of the brain is not active. And then these parts are just active during syntax, right? In fact, the whole brain is going to be active even at rest, right? The brain is going to be engaged in activity, but here we get selective activation, okay? So in these areas, right? So in, if we had a picture of the brain at rest, we would still see colors, but we would see when we then engage the person in a syntactic task, we'll notice that they had increased activation 
here in particular. Okay, so by doing a subtraction, right, sort of just subtracting the rest picture from the active picture, right, we get the, we get a, the result is that we get a picture of what is selectively active in that cognitive task. Here, syntactic processing, okay. So cool, we see some great activity here in these areas of the brain, okay. So nice, these are gonna be areas that are selectively active in syntactic processing, okay? And that doesn't mean that's that's all they do, right? Or these are the, right, um, that these areas are devoted to only syntax, right? But we know that they're at least implicated in syntactic processing and partially responsible for syntactic processing, okay? All right, figure 1B, the, figure on the bottom shows an image of the brain. Um, selective activation in brain area is responsible for semantic processing versus rest. Okay, so here we see when we're given sentence pairs and we're now drawing upon the information in the sentences, the semantic information rather than structural information, this, these areas are particularly engaged. Okay, so compared to rest, we get increased activity in these areas for semantic processing. Okay. All right, cool. So on this figure 1A and B, we see activity versus rest. Okay, so syntax, syntactic processing versus, versus resting state and semantic processing versus resting state. In the next figures, figure 2A and 2B, we see the brain, but this time what we've done is we've subtracted semantics processing from syntactic processing. And then we've also down here, subtracted syntactic processing from semantic processing. Okay, that way, like notice in this figure up here, we have some overlapping areas, right? Here, we just wanna figure out in a little bit more fine grain detail, okay, what areas are just specific to syntax and not semantics, and then which areas are responsible for semantics and not syntax, okay? And we just see some, uh, in figure 1A, these areas are selectively involved in syntax, right, versus semantics, okay? So these areas aren't involved in semantics, but they're involved in syntax, okay? And down here, we see sort of the opposite. We see that these areas are involved in semantics, but not in syntactic processing, okay? Cool. And just like we subtracted the resting image from the active image here, here we're just subtracting one active image from the other active image, right? So we're subtracting here semantics from the syntax, and then here we're subtracting syntax from the semantics, okay? And by doing this systematic study, right, this sort of systematic investigation, we can narrow in on some salient results, okay? And two salient results are the following. Syntactic information is processed in BA44 or Broadman Area 44. And semantic information is processed in BA47. Okay. And this means that these sites in particular are sort of, um, these are most specialized or tuned for that type of processing. Okay. They're going to be other areas that are partially involved and the story becomes more nuanced, but this is sort of a nice uh, beginning point, right? That syntax is BA44 and semantics is BA47. Okay. And here are just other regions of interest. As we are becoming more and more um, knowledgeable in our neuroscience, right? I want us to start to memorize more and more Broadman areas and associate them with their appropriate names, okay? So I've provided, in addition to the BAs, which we can read off of the table, I've provided the names for you here so you can start memorizing these names, okay? So BA44 is the pars or percularis. 
and BA47 is the pars orbitalis, okay? The inferior frontal gyrus includes uh, 44 and 47 as well as 45, okay? So that's the IFG. The middle temporal gyrus is BA21, and the superior temporal gyrus, BA22. Transverse temporal gyrus, BA41. Temporal pole, BA38. And the inferior parietal lobe, BA40. Okay. And just be aware that the BAs don't map cleanly onto these regions, right? There may be some um, partial overlap or it's not a perfect fit, right? Because the, the way that we name these sites are slightly different, okay? All right, and here it's the same results, but with a different image, just so you can practice identifying these regions, okay? So we know that syntactic information is processed in BA44. So where is that? That's right here, BA44. Okay, semantic information is processed in BA47, and that's right here, BA47. Okay, and the pars opercularis is this right here, pars orbitalis is right here. Okay, this 44, 45, and 47, this right here is the IFG or inferior frontal gyrus. Okay, 21 right here is the middle temporal gyrus. Okay, and then 22 right here is the superior temporal gyrus, right? And it's superior because it's above this, okay? And then we have the transverse temporal gyrus, which is right here, BA41, okay? And then the temporal pole, 38, right here. And then finally on this slide, we have the inferior parietal lobe, which is 40, okay? And this is in the... I hope we're starting to put things together, right? Um, occipital, temporal, parietal, and frontal lobes, okay? So as another exercise, try to memorize these Broadman areas. In particular, which areas are responsible for syntactic and semantic processing, but also ask yourself, okay, uh, how do we clump these into frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobes? Okay, our next paper. So the, the value of the first paper, I think that this is a cool paper because not only does it give us some salient results, like what part of the brain is responsible for syntax and what part is responsible for semantics, but importantly, the first article we looked at was an empirical article. And the value in reading lots of empirical articles is that it won't just provide us with results, it'll also provide us with methods for finding out those results. And that's very, very important because what that allows us to do is now we can borrow that method and we can apply that method in a new study, right? So for example, perhaps I wanna do a similar study, but in Korean or in Spanish, right? What I can do now is based on the main idea behind the methods, right? Like, um, having a semantic condition and a syntactic condition, where in the semantic condition, we just keep everything the same except for switching one word with either a synonym or a different word. And in the syntactic condition, we are gonna change the word order, right? We can now re reproduce a very similar study, but for example, on Korean participants or on Spanish participants. And that will allow us to replicate the results of this previous study and extend it in a new way, right? So what we can do is by understanding the methods, we can now go test, uh, replicate the study the, by Bookheimer and DePreto, and we can say, you know what? Their study was legit. Like I know because I just reran it myself on participants and the fMRI data is the same. So that study is, is good to go, right? But then I can also extend that study and say, not only does this study hold for other English speaking speakers, it also holds for Korean speakers and I can extend it to Spanish speakers. And then you see by replicating and extending the study, we further increase our confidence in this result.
Okay, and it's we show that it's not something idiosyncratic to English or English speakers or you know some artifice of the lab, right? So that's why the methods are so important to read through and just appreciate. Okay. What I'm gonna the the value in the second paper is that this is gonna be more of a, a theoretical or a modeling type of paper, right? And so it's gonna be a little bit different than the experimental paper. And what we're what we're trying to do in, in this type of paper is rather than using an experimental method to arrive at a finding, an experimental finding, what we're gonna do in this article is read widely, right? And we're gonna try to collect all the data that exists so far in the literature, and we're gonna try to piece it together into a unified coherent framework, okay? That itself is also very challenging, right? Depending on your strengths and weaknesses, either one might be a better fit or easier for you than the other, right? Some people are great at experiments, but when it comes time to integrate, maybe they're not so good at that. Other people are, are great system builders, but are not able to conduct experiments, okay? So um, all aspects, of course, are important to our broader goal of understanding the mind and how it works. Um, but I just want us to see in this article how you might go piecing together findings from the literature and then try to tell an, a compelling story. Right. And our compelling story is going to be that which makes the most sense of the most data. OK, we'll see that certain theories do a good job of incorporating all the data or at least being compatible with all the data, whereas other theories are going to be incompatible. Right. There's archaic views of astronomy, which believe that the universe um, rotates around the earth, right? Um, we know that that's false now. And how do we know that? Well, all the data that we gather is incompatible with that view that, every, that the earth is the center of the universe, right? And so we see that we had to at some point give up that model of the universe because it, was no, it, had, it, it no longer had explanatory power. There was just all this data that it just couldn't explain. Right. And so we ditched that theory and then we adopted a new theory or model, right? That the earth is not the center of the universe, right? But that the earth itself um, revolves around the sun and so on. Okay. And we adopt that and we have increasing confidence in that view, in that model, because all the new data that we find is compatible and fits well with that model. Right. So What's cool about this article, The Cortical Organization of Syntax by Matchin and Hickok, is that it's going to tell one story about, um, that integrates different components of linguistic processing. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how they do that. Um, <clears throat> and we'll um, also try to match these different brain regions to their Broadman areas, okay? So Matchett and Hickok in a 2020 article, Integrated Research in Linguistics, Psycholinguistics and Neuroscience to propose a neuroanatomical framework for syntax that attributes distinct syntactic computations from different regions of the brain into one unified model. The model by Matchett and Hickok adopts a modern lexicalized view of syntax in which the lexicon and syntactic rules are intertwined. The model of Matchin and Hickok also recognizes a computational asymmetry in the role of syntax during comprehension and production. The model by Matchin and Hickok postulates a hierarchical lexical syntactic function to the posterior middle temporal gyrus, or PMTG which interconnects speech perception and conceptual semantic systems in the temporal and inferior parietal lobes, crucial for both sentence production and comprehension. These relational hierarchies are transformed via the posterior inferior, inferior frontal gyrus, or PIFG, into morphosyntactic sequences, primarily tied to production. Okay. And in the next slide, we'll look 
as sort of the distinction between hierarchical structure, uh, morphosyntactic sequences, and whatnot. All right, so this is a great figure and one of the important contributions of the article. All right, so I wanted my students, I wanted you to spend some time just appreciating what's going on in this figure, okay? All right, so we see a few things going on in this figure. One is a breakdown of different types of linguistic processing, okay? So for example, here we have auditory phonology, okay? Excuse me, this has to do with like perception and comprehension, right? Auditory phonology, like I hear you talking to me, okay? And notice the color, right? This is sort of a purplish color. It's gonna be tied to or associated with a certain area, right? And recall that this is sensible, right? In that in the last lecture when we covered auditory cortex and the auditory system, right? What do we see? right, that the temporal lobes, right, are the site of primary auditory cortex. And so if we're trying to figure out where in the brain is sort of um, the processing of um, auditory phonological information, right here, right? So that's the PSTG, okay? And I've highlighted this right here for you that auditory phonological processing occurs primarily in the posterior superior temporal gyrus or PSTG, okay, right here. Okay, cool, one down. Next, we have articulatory phonology, okay? Here is not so much the uh, comprehension, but the production, okay? So when we, now have to articulate, right? Uh, lake, rake, I need to do all this articulation, speech production, we see we're gonna get activation in some different areas, okay? So this is sort of a lighter blue color and we see that, or, or a teal, um, we'll just call it light blue or baby blue, right? Um, we see that it's activating these four areas, okay, three or four areas, depending on your, whether you're drawing upon the, their names or their Broadman areas, okay. So the sites for articulatory phonological processing include these areas, okay. So here we have the dorsal precentral gyrus, right here, dorsal precentral gyrus, okay. The next site, is the pars opercularis, pars opercularis, we see right here, as well as the ventral precentral gyrus, okay? Ventral precentral gyrus, okay? And then finally, we have the sylvian parietal temporal area, okay? Or this area right here, SPT, okay? So those areas are involved in articulatory phonology. All right, next we have hierarchical lexical syntactic processing, right? And this has to do with our knowledge of hierarchical structure, right? So we went over uh, earlier in the section on syntax, right? Different movement operations for forming questions and um, the hierarchical nature of language, okay? And this area, right? The PMTG or posterior middle temporal gyrus is primarily involved in this hierarchical lexical syntactic processing. Okay, now this is our knowledge of hierarchical structure. At some point, sometimes we have to convert our knowledge of hierarchical structure in the linear form, right? Like our knowledge of movement operations for forming questions, it's, abstract, right? But when we communicate, when I'm writing things down or talking to you, there's a, a, a moment or there, there's a place in which I have to convert, right, from that hierarchical structure into a linear order, right? And, you know, that might be hard for some of us, right? Like the knowledge may be there hierarchically, but then like, mm, how do I put it in the right order, right? And this is the area that's going to be 
particularly involved in the linear morphosyntactic processing of language, the, the sort of linear structure, okay? And the area that's particularly involved in linear morphosyntactic processing is the pars triangularis, okay? or this area right here that's in yellow. Okay, so syntax, hierarchical syntax, right? Like tree diagrams, which is somewhat abstract. This is in green. And then the linear, right, uh, production, the linear morphosyntactic processing of language is here in the pars triangularis, okay? Cool, and then the last one, the sort of last aspect of linguistic processing is the conceptual semantic aspect of linguistic processing, right? So not just structure, although structure is super awesome when it comes to language, but also that we understand meanings, right? That there's a distinction between pit bulls and Dobermans or that lawyers and attorneys are similar, right? So the areas that are involved in conceptual semantic processing are the angular gyrus right here and the anterior temporal lobe right here. Okay, so we can see that there's different areas of the brain that are primarily responsible for different aspects of linguistic processing, but also that they all work together in a unified way, right? So we see distinct boxes, but also we notice arrows between the boxes, right? Like there's some relationship between articulatory phonology and, articula and auditory phonology. Right, so there is a bidirectional arrow here, okay, and and so on, arrows and arrows all the way through. And one of the fun things that we're going to do when it comes time to actually, I'm going to teach the course in the spring of 2023, cognitive neuroscience and language. We'll investigate this in much more detail, right? The neuroscience of syntax, semantics, as well as articulatory and auditory phonology, and of course semantics too. Okay. Cool. In the next slide, what I want us to do is not just understand these as major areas, right? Like, ah, the PSTG is involved in auditory phonological processing. How cool. But I also want us to practice associating these with Broadman areas. Okay. And just to reiterate, the Broadman areas don't map on perfectly on to these areas of the brain. Right? For example, there's debate among neuroscientists about what actually to include as part of the ATL, right? Like the anterior temporal lobe. Is it just BA38 or does it also include a little bit of like BA28 or other nearby areas? Okay, so um, we don't have to worry about those nuanced debates just yet, right? Uh, for today, I just want us to sort of tie major BAs to these areas. It'll help us remember the BAs, okay, the Broadman areas. Okay, so we're, let's just start with the posterior superior temporal gyrus, okay? And this is BA22, all right? So right here, posterior superior temporal gyrus, okay? The dorsal precentral gyrus, BA4, right here, okay? The pars opercularis is BA44 right here. And uh, ventral precentral gyrus is also BA44. So notice in the last slide, I mentioned how there may be three or four areas responsible for articulatory phonological processing, right? These are three areas, if you just look at it visually, um, there are also three areas by Brodman's areas, uh, but right, if we're going by names, the pars opercularis and the ventral precentral gyrus have different, slightly different names, okay. And then for the sylvian parietal temporal area, we see that that's BA40 over here, okay. The pars triangularis for linear morphosyntactic processing is BA45. So here, the posterior middle temporal gyrus for hierarchical lexical syntactic processing, uh, BA21. Okay, so part of this area, okay. 
And the, uh, the areas involved in conceptual semantic processing include BA39 here, as well as BA38, the anterior temporal lobe here, okay? So um, I hope that, that this is interesting and uh, useful for you. Um, what I would like for you to do as we start think, as we read through more and more articles on the neuroscience of language, I want you to think about whether this model is perfect or whether some of the data from the other articles conflicts or supports this model, right? We might find that as we read through other articles, maybe we need to modify some of these, right? But this is the model for linguistic processing as proposed by Machin and Hickok. All right. And this is another cool figure that was included in this article. And this just shows syntactic deficits in aphasia. So the right image, I'm sorry, I, I, I accidentally, uh, this should say left, right? I accidentally put right image twice. So this should say the left image, right? This image right here. The left image shows results from a study on brain atrophy and sentence production. So brain regions where atrophy was correlated with lower scores on the composite syntactic measure, indicating greater syntactic impairments are shown in red, okay? So the area is in red. Brain regions where atrophy was correlated with reduced numbers of embedding are shown in blue. Okay, so different aspects of um, syntactic production, right? Uh, in red and in blue. The right side figure now, this one over here, this, this one focuses on comprehension as opposed to product, production. And the right image shows results from a study on brain lesions and sentence comprehension. Regions associated with impaired auditory sentence comprehension are shown in red. And regions associated with impaired auditory description naming are shown in blue, okay? So in, in blue, this is just a slightly different task where they might be given an image, like a dog, right? A dog walking and they have to describe or name the picture, okay? And this is just another comprehension type task. Regions associated with both impaired comprehension and description are shown in yellow, okay? So these are just areas where, um, between these different forms of comprehension tasks, right? So we might say, ah, one kind of comprehension recruits more of these neural circuits, whereas another type of task, comprehension task recruits these neural circuits. Well, we wanna generalize, right? Like what area of the brain is responsible for like comprehension more generally? Well, we're looking at overlapping areas now, right? Like, like these areas, okay. All right, cool. And then our last slide for today is just sort of a summary slide, right? Showing the model by Matchin and Hickok here, as well as the, another photo of the brain below, image of the brain below that includes all the Broadman areas, okay? So go ahead and take a moment to just appreciate the different, the five different kinds of linguistic processing that the brain engages in and try to remember the major areas that are responsible for each kind of linguistic processing. Okay. So our main goal for today was to think about the cognitive neuroscience of language, in particular focusing on syntax. Okay, we also covered some other areas of linguistic processing, but today we also wanted to focus on uh, syntactic processing. In our next lecture, we're gonna continue looking at the cognitive neuroscience of language, but we're gonna focus more on semantics, okay? So there's a lot of cool research on semantic processing and our focus for the next lecture will be on that, okay? What part of the brain is engaged in um, understanding and processing meaning, right? And I think that that's really cool, okay? So thank you so much for your attention today. I hope you enjoyed the lecture and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for our next lecture.